So I'd like to introduce um, today's speaker. We have Tanya Lukin. She is a CPA business owner helping nonprofits and small businesses with their accounting and operations for over 20 years. Um, she's um, passionate about ending shoebox accounting. Um, with new technology, Tanya's firm is improving the accuracy and timeliness of accounting for small businesses. Um, when she's not running her accounting firm, um, she loves to travel and to also hang out with her dog, Barbara Gordon. Um, she also is a huge fan of Chuck Norris jokes and her favorite is Chuck Norris can divide by zero. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Tanya. Thanks Faustine. Uh, hi everyone my name is Tanya um, and I do love Chuck Norris jokes. My favorite one of the moment is Chuck Norris's tears cure COVID-19 but too bad he never cries. So I'm going to pretend you're all virtually laughing and not groaning but um, today I want to talk about internal controls and employee fraud, uh, which is called occupational fraud, and just kind of give you some ideas about what happens out there in small businesses and large organizations about, you know, how employees steal from their employers, um, what types of fraud are perpetrated against companies, and then some things that you can do to help mitigate that risk. Um, Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about, um, today we're gonna to go over some statistics from the 2018 report to the nations by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. So um, this is actually a really riveting read. <laughs> I know you're probably cringing there too, but um, I actually enjoy this report. So the 2020 report, um, I'm not sure if it's come out yet. Um, it might be delayed because of COVID, but they put it out every other year. Um, and then what they look at is occupational fraud. And occupational fraud is committed against the organization by its own officers, directors, or employees. And it constitutes an attack on the organization from within by the very people who are entrusted to protect its assets and resources. So officers, directors, and employees. Um, you'd be surprised how many people um, would perpetrate fraud against their own companies. Um, we'll talk about that too. So what they did in the 2018 report is they looked at about 2,700 cases of occupational fraud in 125 different countries and 23 in different industries. You can see the total losses here were $7 billion and that median loss was 130. And median, it's important to remember that median isn't quite average, it's the one in the middle. So you take the high one and the low one and then the one in the middle is the median. 22% of the cases lost over a million dollars. Um, and the median duration of a fraud scheme was 16 months. And corruption was the most common scheme across every global region. And we'll talk about what corruption is in a little bit. So small businesses, their median loss for um, businesses with 100 employees was $104,000. But for less than 100 employees, it was $200,000. So businesses, smaller businesses, were losing almost twice as much to occupational fraud. Internal control weaknesses were responsible for nearly half of the frauds. Um, 18 anti-fraud controls analyzed were associated with lower fraud losses and quicker detection. So we're going to talk about those 18, and we're going to talk about a few of them in detail. But basically, internal control weaknesses because there was no internal controls, there was no way for the organization to detect or prevent the fraud. Fraudsters who've been with their company stole twice as much. So employees that have been there for five years stole on average or a median amount of $200,000 and employees that were there than less than five years stole $100,000. And now we're gonna talk about Bob. Oh, Bob. So the, the thing that I wanted to point out, I'm just going to back this up here a second. Um, this picture here, maybe, oh, heaven's sakes. I'm sorry, guys. Okay, so when they talk about opportunity, pressure, and rationalization, like those three things make up the fraud triangle. So there has to be an opportunity for employees to steal. They have to feel some kind of pressure, whether it's internal pressure to meet sales quota, external pressure because let's say their spouse got laid off or they're recently divorced or they maybe like Bob have a gambling problem and then they have to rationalize and justify it like I'm not being paid enough by my employer 
um, I'm only borrowing a little bit was Bob's rationalization. So it's, it's those three things when they meet tend to create the fraud, um, an opportunity for fraud. So occupational fraud is committed. Um, these are just some facts about the percent of cases and the median losses. So the highest number of, of cases is asset misappropriation, almost 90% of the time. Corruption happens 38% of the time and financial statement fraud happens 10% of the time. So corruption and asset misappropriation, they work together. So sometimes one fraud can be like classified as both. Um, the median loss for asset misappropriation was 114,000, corruption was 250,000, and financial statement fraud was 800,000. So financial statement fraud, and we'll talk about that more too, but you can see that even though it happens only a small amount of the time, it leads to the huge, the largest impact financially. So asset misappropriation is a scheme in which an employee will steal or misuse the employee organization's resources. So it's theft, uh, just flat out theft, stealing cash, stealing inventory, um, stealing office supplies, faking expense reports, things like that. Corruption is a scheme in which an employee misuses his or her influence in a business transaction that violates their duty to the employer to gain direct or indirect benefit. So bribery or conflicts of interest. Um, for example, like if you were to, um, let's say you own a company and you're the controller or CFO and you're in charge of paying bills and you could create fictitious invoices from a fake vendor and then pay those and collect that money yourself. That would be an example of corruption. Uh, financial, financial statement fraud is a scheme in which an employee intentionally causes misstatement or omission of material information on the organization's financial statements. So fictitious revenues or inflating assets. So for example, it's the end of the month, let's say it's the end of the quarter and quarterly bonuses are gonna go out to the sales team and someone in the sales department will record a sale that happened on March 31st, let's say, but then the entire transaction gets returned on April 4th. So that for example would be fictitious revenue it also inflates assets because it records accounts receivable that is never going to be collected. So <clears throat> um, there's different type of asset misappropriation schemes. So the most common are check and payment tampering, billing, theft of non-cash assets, expense reimbursements, and payroll. And we'll talk about some more of these in detail, but basically check and payment tampering would be um, I don't know if you remember that movie, uh, Catch Me If You Can, but where they would, where he would um, wash off the name on checks and then write his own name in. Um, a billing scheme would be to create fixed, fictitious invoices from vendors that are then paid. Theft of non-cash assets would be inventory, for example, um, or using the company's Amazon account to watch Prime movies at home, something like that. Expense reimbursements, just flat out falsifying expenses on your reimbursement report. And then payroll examples would be um, inflating your hours or artificially adjusting someone's rate of pay. So in these two columns, the column on the left is less than 100 employees. The column on the right is 100 and more employees. And remember that the median losses for small businesses are almost as twice as much as large organizations. So you can see here that frauds caused by lack of internal controls were 42% of the cases in small businesses. So if there were enough adequate controls in place in smaller businesses, that risk, while it couldn't be mitigated to zero, could definitely not be 42%. Um, you'll see in larger organizations, because there's more people, there's more opportunity to have functions separated, which we'll talk about also, um, which is why their internal control percentage is 25%, but 44% was detected by TIP in large organizations. Uh, <laughs> I apologize, this slide's kind of busy, but I just wanted to show you the different types of frauds um, that are perpetrated and the difference between large organizations and small organizations. So you can see that corruption in a large organization is way more of a problem than it is in a smaller organization. But corruption, billing, and check and payment tampering, expense reports, expense reimbursements, skimming, and cash on hand are the bigger problems for smaller organizations. 
Um, the most common small business frauds are skimming, uh, like an extra cash register, uh, which we don't so much use now, but um, it was definitely, a, a, there's still skimming schemes that happen. Um, and then billing schemes where you falsify vendor invoices, check and payment tampering, where you edit the payee or amounts, and expense reimbursements, um, where you just falsify an expense report. So let's give you some examples. Um, a government mailroom employee skimmed more than $2 million in taxpayer refund checks that had been returned to the post office for bad addresses. The employee, with the help of several outside accomplices, was able to deposit the stolen checks into various banks and withdraw the proceeds. The scheme was uncovered when a taxpayer called about an overdue refund and found out that his check had already been cashed. Um, and it, I like this one. <laughs> An employee in charge of taking the company's money to the bank would regularly remove the currency and then alter the company's deposit slip to reflect the lower deposit amount. The worker, obviously not an accounting genius, didn't realize the discrepancy would be discovered when sales and cash were reconciled. A purchasing agent for a major corporation set up a vendor file in his wife's maiden name. Then they went on to prove more than a million in company payments to her. The supporting documentation consisted of the wife's invoices for consulting services that were never rendered. A clerk in the purchasing department, suspicious of the agent's recent purchase of a new boat and car, caught onto the scheme and turned him in. Remember this about the new boat and car, because we'll talk about um, the, some of the behavioral signs that employees will display when they're, when they're perpetrating fraud. A CEO of a small nonprofit agency sold $35,000 from its coffers by submitting check requests to the accounting department. The checks were made payable to outside bank and that the CEO controlled. The accounting personnel, fearful of angering the boss, made out the checks and delivered them to him. One accounting clerk finally had enough and alerted the outside auditors who confirmed the disbursements were not legitimate. So remember this part too about the outside auditors because we'll talk about um, how they could help with internal controls. A worker from one company submitted an expense reimbursement for a trip he supposedly took for business purposes. Actually, he took his girlfriend to a bicycle rally and attempted to charge the expense to the company. One problem though, on his itinerary, the worker listed the independent auditor that was examining his expense reimbursement as his traveling companion. So again, not an accounting genius, but um, a controller created a fictitious merchant processing account with a slight name variation for the company's major advertising vendor. Before the fraud was uncovered by accident, two years after it began, she had used the fictitious merchant account to charge the company's credit cards for $480,000. And this company became my client in October of 2017. They recovered $100,000 from their insurance because they were specifically insured for employee theft and the controller has fled the country, um, so there's no chance of restitution. Um, this slide is also very busy, so I apologize. Across the bottom here, um, these are the anti-fraud controls that we're gonna discuss in detail. Um, and you can see the number of frauds that anti-fraud controls that are in place in smaller organizations are half of what are in larger organizations. So it's very important, these anti-fraud controls um, in detecting fraud and preventing fraud. These are the most effective. So we're gonna talk about them here and then we're gonna talk about some of them in detail and then we're gonna talk about what I think everyone on this call is capable of. So the first is a code of conduct. The second, external audit of your financial statements. Internal audit department. Management certification of financial statements. An external audit of internal controls over financial reporting management review, a hotline, an independent audit committee. And I fully understand that all of those words were very accountant-y, but we're gonna explain them in detail. Next, employee support programs, an anti-fraud policy, fraud training for employees, fraud training for managers and executives, a dedicated fraud department, function, or team, formal fraud risk assessments, surprise audits, proactive data monitoring and analysis, job rotation and mandatory vacation, and rewards for whistleblowers. So 
those again were a lot of accountant words and I'm gonna we're gonna boil down the ones that I think are most important in my opinion and the ones that I think are achievable for all of you on the call today okay um, feel free to ask any questions if you have any I'll check the zoom um, I can't see the zoom chat so put it in the Q&A please Okay, the primary internal control weaknesses that contribute to occupational fraud, 30% of the time, it's lack of internal controls. 19% of the time, it's override of existing controls. 18% of the time, lack of management review. 10% poor tone at the top, and 8% lack of competent personnel and oversight. How does the perpetrator's level of authority relate to the scheme duration? So you can see here that if it's an owner or executive, they've been perpetrating the fraud for 24 months, okay? In this one, how does the perpetrator's tenure report to the occupational fraud? You can see that if they've been there one to five years, for that in 44% of the cases, but if they the, the loss is $241,000, they've been there more than 10 years. So the longer they've been there, the more they steal. But the most stealing happens in one to five years. Here was a background check run prior to the perpetrator hiring. 48% of the time it was no. 52% of the time it was yes. However, 10% of, of the yeses, 10% of them revealed a red flag. And now we're going to talk about Bob again because he's so cheesy and the music's so great, right? So that part at the end where he said it, he's never been charged, this is a problem with fraud. Um, so when occupational fraud is committed against an organization, um, in the past when it's happened to, um, to businesses I know or clients I've taken over, um, the owners are reluctant to do it because they're embarrassed. And I get that it's embarrassing, but at the same time, like it's a problem because that person will just go on to the next organization and you can see that you know, half of the people are, were doing background checks, um, but only 10% of the time there was a problem. So it's important to report um, fraudsters. So these are some of the behavioral red flags. In 85% of all cases, fraudsters displayed at least one behavioral red flag. So here, 50% of the cases they exhibited um, multiple red flags and the most common the, mo the six most common ones were living beyond their means so remember in the one example that we talked about with the the employee was suspicious because the someone had a new car and a new boat financial difficulties unusually close association with a vendor or a customer control issues and unwillingness to share duty divorce or family problems and a wheeler dealer attitude so again, here are those again. The last one that I want to mention to um, the number seven one is irritability, suspiciousness, or defensiveness. These are some others that are a little less common, but still common. Addiction problems, complaints about, complaints about inadequate pay, excessive pressure from within an organization, social isolation, past legal problems, refusal to take a vacation. Um, this one seems strange, the refusal to take a vacation, but usually when someone's running a fraud scheme, it's kind of like a house of cards. Um, so if somebody's not there to, let's say, rob Peter to pay Paul, then the whole thing will come crashing down. So they don't take vacation, they don't share responsibilities or roles because no one else is going to you know, make those transfers or shuffle that money or record that weird transaction. So um, past employment problems, compl complaints about lack of authority, excessive family peer pressure or instability in life circumstances. Um, so here, the owner executives, 24% of the time, they displayed an unusually close association with the vendor, 21% of the time control issues and unwillingness to share duty, 22% of the time a wheeler dealer attitude. If it's an employee, you can see that financial difficulties and complaints about inadequate pay are the highest um, and, and unusually close associations are the highest for um, behavioral red flags for an employee role. The behavioral red flags also vary by gender. Um, for men, it's an unusually close association with vendors or customers, the wheeler dealer attitude, and the excessive pressure from within the organization. For women, it's financial difficulties, divorce and family problems, and instability in their life circumstances. 
53% of the time, nothing was recovered um, from the businesses that suffered from occupational fraud. 32% made a partial recovery and 15% recovered all losses. So I own a small business and I've owned one for um, 20 years now, but I couldn't afford to lose $104,000 or $200,000. So the more victims lose, the less likely they are to make a full recovery. Okay, so now that I've probably like terrified you that somebody's stealing your money, <laughs> I wanna talk about the control activities. So do you remember this list of these 18 things? Are these all possible in your company? My guess would be probably not. So, or the cost benefit is out gonna, the cost is gonna outweigh the benefit. So let's talk about that. Um, in this example, assume that you own a sporting goods store and your store loses on average $45,000 a year due to shoplifting. A security guard would cost you $75,000 a year. Does the cost outweigh the benefit? No, it's actually going to cost you $30,000 more per year to hire a security guard. But would the losses become zero? Could that security guard mitigate all losses? Or are you maybe going to likely only have $10,000 walk out the door every year? So in that case, you would be in the hole $40,000 from hiring a security guard. So this probably wouldn't be the best internal control for this business. Does that make sense? Okay. The burden of internal control is a lack of resources, and those resources could be talent, time, or money. A lack of separation of duties, so this comes from a lack of personnel, because you just don't, a large, you don't have as many people as large organizations, so you can't spread out all the functions like you should. Improper management overrides, and we're gonna talk about this one in detail in a minute, because I know those words are probably very foreign. <laughs> and recruiting unskilled board members. This also implies to your, applies to your management. So if you have management that don't understand their financial information, they don't have to know how to read financial statements, but they have to understand the numbers that come out of their departments, that could be a problem. And then shifting internal control shifts the focus from management to internal control activities and away from production activities. So you could have, let's say, um, you could have an operations manager that instead of managing employees and making sure that tasks and work are getting done to build clients, for example, or customers, they're spending time reviewing reports and working on internal controls. So those, those are some of, the, some of the burdens that every business has to, ha has to deal with. All right, so improper management of, of um, of management overrides. So I'm gonna to skip to this slide and we're gonna go back. So it's it's the AICPA who is like our, it's like the, the nationwide club for CPAs. Um, <laughs> they say that in management override of internal control is the Achilles heel of fraud prevention. So this is the biggest problem that you have. The intervention of managers in handling financial information and making decisions contrary to internal controls. I'm gonna explain more. Management is responsible for the design, the implementation, and the maintenance of internal control, and the company is always exposed to the danger of management override. So basically, if you have an internal control, regardless, let's say that you own, um, well, I'll give you a real life example. So I was sitting at a client's office and they are a general contractor. And one of their internal controls is that the project manager has to sign off on all vendor invoices for materials for those projects before the vendor gets paid. So the boss comes in, the owner comes into the accounting office one day when I'm sitting there working and he says to the accountant, he says, Matt, I need you to pay this supplier for these materials. And Matt says, but the project manager hasn't signed off on them yet. And the owner says, no, you have to pay them anyways. So that right there, what's the point of the internal control if the owner or the manager is always going to override them? So that's the danger. It's easy and it's a slippery slope because I imagine every one of you can imagine a situation in your business where that could happen to you. So I think in that instance, it's more important for Matt, the accountant to say, wait right here, I'm gonna go get the project manager on the phone to approve that invoice and then get it paid which you should be able to do in the span of an hour, right? So remember that this improper management overrides is a very dangerous slippery slope. Um, so other kind of management overrides, 
recording fictitious business events or transactions or changing the timing and recognition of legitimate transactions. Establishing and reversing reserves to manipulate results and altering records and terms related to significant or unusual transactions. So examples of each one of these. The first one, um, let's say that it's April 1st and I am a salesperson and um, I go to my boss and say, I just signed this huge client, but too bad they didn't sign up yesterday because we all would have made our quarterly bonuses. So there could be a management override for my boss to date that transaction on March 31st, so we all get our bonuses. Establishing or reverse, reversing reserves to manipulate results is something that's less common in smaller organizations because we don't use reserves a lot. So I'm just kind of going to skip this one, but if you have questions about it, email me later. Um, the third one, altering records and terms related to significant or unusual transactions. So here, let's say that your usual terms for a customer or client are 30 days, and your sales team agrees to give someone 90-day terms. So they, give, they extend significant or unusual terms because that might give the client more time to pay, but what, is that, what are your odds of being able to collect it in 90 days? Actions to address the management override. So here, these are just some things that everyone can do. So maintain skepticism. Strengthen your understanding of the business. And it says committee, but like any, know how your business operates. Brainstorm ways to identify fraud risks. Use a code of conduct. Cultivate a whistleblower program. Develop a broad information and feedback network. And this network can include internal and external auditors if you have them committee members, or key employees. So most of you probably have key employees. So for example, like I'm, I'm a sole owner and I have seven employees, but um, only one of them is a key employee to me. So I actually use a friend from college that's my financial advisor to help review my information on my financial statements. So there's always, like he would be a committee member to me. So this is one thing that I think that everyone can do is write a code of conduct and make it known to your employees and your managers. So a code of conduct is designed to deter wrongdoing. It's designed to promote honest and ethical behavior, address conflicts of interest, address compliance with laws, rules, and regulations, include a description of what constitutes fraudulent behavior and the accountability. These are some common elements that you would put in a code of conduct. Um, and I'm just going to cover a few of them, and I want to talk about um, gift and entertainment issues with suppliers and customers. So imagine that you have one, 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 one main supplier, and let's, we'll go back to my contractor example. So there's one main supplier for them, and every year the production manager or, and the inventory manager are wined and dined constantly by this, this outside company. So in that situation, when it comes time to determine if you're going to continue working with that supplier or if you're going to entertain offers from other suppliers, how likely is it that your production and inventory manager are going to be, like, do they want to give up all those gifts of the wining and dining and entertainment? I don't know. So that's something that you would want to put in, have a gift and entertainment policy that employees are not allowed to accept gifts over a certain value, or it has to be talked about with the ownership beforehand, things like that. Um, a couple other things here, just make sure that you say that they're not allowed as to do espionage and bribery activities. Um, and then talk about political contributions too, use of controlled substance. And these are the things that you're comfortable with. There's no rhyme or reason about, um, you know, it's just the things that you think are important in your business and in your industry and where your level of comfort is. And then cultivate a culture of honesty. So top executives model the appropriate behavior. Um, communicate expectations require written confirmation and acceptance of expectations and create a positive work environment. So I'm gonna give you an example here too. I was sitting around um, a meeting with a client and 
he was, it was kind of his annual meeting. So it was the owner and then the heads of his different departments. And the owner was talking about when he was a teenager and he worked at a fast food chicken place. And he said at the end of every shift, you know, towards the end of the night when they were closing up, um, about 10 minutes before they closed, they would fry up a huge batch of chicken and they would put it in the little warming case and then no one would come to buy it. So at the end of the night, they all got to take home like tons and tons of chicken. And this to me is not modeling appropriate behavior because if he owned that chicken restaurant now and those employees were doing that for to him, how do you think he would feel today? So make sure that you model the appropriate behavior. So it's, it's the, you know, like, I don't, to me, it makes very much sense, but like, make sure that you are, are putting out the behavior that you want returned and create a positive work environment. So if people like their boss and like where they work and who they work for and feel, feel excited to go to work every day, they're going to be less likely to want to try to ruin it. A CEO, for example, must state explicitly in the code of conduct or elsewhere that dishonest actions will not be tolerated and the violators will be terminated and held legally accountable for their actions. A strong statement from management that any exceptions to this policy must have top management approval sends a strong message about expectations. So this is, this is something else. So like if someone breaks the policy, you need to follow what you've outlined the consequences would be in in your code of conduct. And I have one more sort of video here. So that was the part that was in, important there. So at the end, he said that underlings were too scared to question their bosses because of the corporate culture. So this is why culture is very important to help detect fraud. Because if people aren't afraid to go to management and ask questions or aren't afraid to just ask questions in general or investigate things. It's going to create a more open and honest culture in your company. So what questions do you ask and what information do you look for? Are you able to recognize the red flags? So we'll talk about those. These are some questions that you can ask your employees. Are you aware of any issues that could cause embarrassment to the company? Have you ever been told anything in confidence or otherwise that would embarrass the company if it was known publicly? Is there any activity in the organization in which you're uncomfortable, consider unusual, or that you believe would warrant further investigations? Are you aware of any current or past current fraud occurrence or any kind of fraud in the organization? Do you know any situations in which fraud could occur? And do you feel comfortable raising issues without fear of retribution? Are there any questions that we shouldn't have asked that we should have asked? Which that one's kind of a pitfall. Tell me the things that I don't know. <laughs> um, more control activities, segregation of duties, proper procedures for authorization, adequate documents and records, physical control over assets, and independent checks on performance. We'll talk about all of these right now. Segregation of duty, basically the principle is you share responsibilities and you disperse the critical functions of that process to one or more departments. So the first one here in cash, so one person opens the envelope, the second person records them in the accounting system. So it reduces the risk that let's say someone mails a check that doesn't have a, a, your company's name on it. What's to stop someone from writing that, writing their own name on that check? Accounts receivable, the person that records the cash received from the customers is not the same person that creates credit memos. So if person A decides to deposit a check into their own bank account and then record the credit memo, no one would ever know that that money wasn't collected and was stolen instead. Inventory, the first person orders goods from a suppliers. The second person logs or receives the goods in the accounting system. So if someone were doing work over the weekend and there was no separation of these duties, they could order a bunch of parts and never log them received into the accounting system. And then though they could use those parts to, or they could log the parts, um, not mark them to a customer and they could use them over the weekend for their own work. Payroll, the person that compiles gross and net pay information is different than the person that verifies the calculation. This prevents the first person from artificially increasing pay for some employees or paying fake employees. Proper procedures for authorization. So these are just some questions that I'm gonna ask you in, you know, in your head, answer yes or no. Does your AP staff, your accounts payable staff make vendors prove an unexpected invoice is owed? 
How does the person paying the bill know that you received the goods or services? Are costs in line with the budget amount or, or a fixed expense list? Who decides what gets paid and when? And where's your signature stamp? Signature stamps drive me crazy as an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> so I, because then if someone's like, oh, so-and-so just has my signature stamp, they can use it whenever. And then I'm like, okay, where do they keep it? And they're like, I don't know. So it's a problem. Like your signature, your signature is a very good internal control. You physically signing or approving payments that go out the door. That is one of the best things you can do for your company. Uh, adequate documents and records. If you ask for a copy of an invoice, will your staff find it quickly? Are receipts organized? Is there proper documentation attached to an expense report? Like, do you have employees that turn in reports all the time that say, oh, I lost the receipt, I lost the receipt? Are expenses marked as approved, entered and paid? And who reports the payroll? So a lot of these things can be done electronically now, um, especially with things like bill.com. But there's ways, like, these are things like, again, do you know where these things are? Do you have these things? Physical control over your assets. Where are your company's cell phones and tablets? Who signs the checks? Who has credit cards? Who has access to your inventory? Do you have a tool policy? Who's driving your vehicles? Do you lock the doors at night? How do you know the doors are getting locked? Are your vehicles locked at night? Independent checks on performance. So these are also something every one of you can do. Look at your bank statements. Look at your credit card statements. Review your, the company's expense reports from employees, inspect your company vehicles, count the cash on hand, look at payroll. Some other things, does your staff take vacations? When does money go to the bank? I like to use a rule of five for when money goes to the bank. So when there's more than five things, when it's been more than five days, or when there's more than $5,000. And in some, some of my companies, some of my smaller nonprofits I work with, that number is $500. Does your staff put off answering questions or give you half, half answers? And then do you have suspicions? So this list, I'm gonna leave this up here for a minute because um, I want you all to make a note. I think all of these things are possible for everyone on this call. So write a code of conduct for your business. Go back to those questions and like, my email will be at the end or Faustine, like I'm not sure if you'll send it, but we can send you the slide deck. I'll happily send it out. But write a code of conduct for your business. Write a budget because if you expect your telephone, your cell phone bill, um, for example, if you expect the cell phone bill to be $1,200 a month and all of a sudden it's $1,600, you're gonna look at it when you look at your budget versus actuals. Understand and review your financial statements. If you don't know how to read your financial statements, there's We'll, we'll, Faustine and I will arrange another, another conference, but um, we'll make it so that you understand your financial statements. What are you looking for? What are you looking at? But just look at them and ask questions about them. Understand and monitor your accounting process. Know the answer to those questions. Know where your signature stamp is. Know how your employees determine if a bill is legitimate or not. Understand that process. What days do they pay bills? What days did money go to the bank? Reduce your management overrides. This is a conversation that you have with all of your managers. What's possible? Like, how do you do these things? Why are overrides important? Like, why do we need to mitigate overrides? Create an employee support program or mentoring program so the employees are comfortable going to someone to ask questions if they don't understand. Because remember what we saw with Toshiba? Nobody wanted to speak up. And maintain a skeptical attitude. I'm not saying go around thinking everyone's stealing from you, but people might be stealing from you. <laughs> Lack of management understanding is a material weakness. So if you don't understand internal controls, your organization will be materially weak, okay? That's something else that you wanna make sure. So use these things, create these things, and protect your business. And here's my information. So, all right, I'm all set. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, if anyone has any questions, um please type them in the chat option. Tanya can answer them. Um, I actually have a question. I know you um, shared statistics on the age range of people um, committing fraud in companies. Um, is there a breakdown, do you know, if males or females are more likely to commit those? Um, you know what? I don't recall off the top of my head. 
Um, I, I, I suspect though, um, now that I say that, I think in that first video with Bob, that more perpetrators are men. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I love those cheesy little Bob videos, by the way. <laughs> they are, they are really cheesy, but they are good. It's really good yeah. information as well. Um, we have a question. How often should outside auditors audit my small business? So outside auditors are usually, um, one, something that's very expensive. Two, so if you don't have to have it done, um, I'm not sure that you would. Um, usually outside audits are required um, like for Fortune 5, for anyone that's traded on the SEC, they have to have an audit. We all remember about the Arthur Anderson and Ron scandal with the auditors. Um, but if you're just a regular small business, you can hire an auditing firm to come in. Usually they audit once a year. Um, and it's a requirement ordinarily for uh, businesses that receive certain amounts of federal funding and nonprofits and anyone that's traded on the SEC, but not a requirement for any small business. So if you're asking, I would start with that list of things first um, with this list before I hire an auditor. Okay, thank you. And then we have a question on um, the list of questions that you provided to ask employees. Um, what do you say, how would you suggest asking um, employees this in a yearly survey or how would you even approach to ask employees these? And um, yes, I think could, this is the slide. Mm -hmm. So you could do this, um, you could do everyone tomorrow if you wanted. Um, and you could just say, hey, we're looking, we, we're looking into new internal controls for the company kind of thing. Or we want to make sure that we protect ourselves into the future, something like that. Um, and you can ask everyone at once. You can ask, ask employees um, at their annual reviews. You can create a Google survey and send it out and have people answer anonymous, anonymously. Um, you can hire people to facilitate these questions and interview your employees for you. So any, any one of those. So I would say probably at least once a year. Great, thank you. And then um, what is the biggest fraud that you've discovered while working with the business? Um, the woman, so the, when I was talking about the woman that created a fictitious merchant account. So my client used to pay a lot of money to the Maricopa County Home Show. And on their credit card statements, it would say Maricopa County Home Show, S-H-O-W. And then some of them would say Maricopa County Home Show, S-H-O. And the W would be dropped off, which nobody thinks about because why would it, you know, it just drops off. Like it, we all know that things get truncated on our credit card statements. So in that instance, when, when I saw all of those, I'm like, why, why are there so many charges? And he's like, well, we prepaid for them. And I'm like, but I don't have any receipts for them. So that led to this whole thing where I just happened to look at the, the credit card statement and ask why there were so many charges to the Maricopa County Home Show when there's only, like, as you might know, living here, if you do live here, there's only four or five home shows a year. So um, it was, that was odd and very disturbing and frustrating. So. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, I'll just take a final look. But thank you so much, Tanya, for taking time out of your busy day um, to help present this topic. I know it's very beneficial for all of our business owners out there listening. Um, please reach out to Tanya if you do have any questions or if you need, you, um, need her to look over your company or need help. Um, she's a great reference. I know that we work with her closely um, as well. Um, this webinar was recorded. so. If um, you miss any part of it or you need to review the information, um, it will be posted in 122 Business Days on events.bbcommunity.org. Um, and also, we will go ahead and send out the slide deck to all of our participants today as well. Um, I don't see any other final questions. So thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Please stay safe out there and please stay healthy.